So the, um, the talk that I've prepared is based on, uh, um, on uh, some specific, I mean, not so specific, but the, some mechanisms that are involved in the progression of, uh, of, uh, of art failure. So the point is that we have uh, so many intermediate phenotypes that can be uh, sometimes that can be recognized through specific uh, diagnostic or uh, techniques, imaging techniques in particular. So, for example, chronic ischemia, hypertension, diabetes, genetic cardiomyopathy, uh, anti-cancer related cardiodoxity activates a series of mechanisms that uh, includes hormonal activation, metabolic modif modification, structural change, and early cardiac dysfunction that all together, or with the prevalence of one or the other, according to the original etiology, lead to the final cardiac dysfunction that is characterized by the enlargement of the left ventricle and the depression of the ejection fraction that we know is generally uh, calculated through echocardiography, through uh, the means of a Taylor's formula, for example, or, as in general we do, with the Simpson formula to calculate and also to define the different kind of of uh, heart failure, FRF, FPF, or the mild uh, reduced ejection fraction. But important goal, goal will be to identify, to early identify, some intermediate phenotype that, are character, that characterize the heart failure, particular or the hormone activation, the metabolic modification, or the subtle structural change that interfere, that uh, happen during the progression of the heart failure. These are a list of techniques that can be used, not only the echocardiography, but also, for example, the use of an image, the use of a positron emission tomography, or the cardiac MRI. So to start with the first one, one of the first modifications, we cannot uh, describe every, every all the mechanisms that are included in the, in the, in the progression of artifact. I would like to give you some uh, resume of uh, one of the principal mechanisms of, uh, of uh, remodeling of uh, activation that we have during heart failure, that is one related to increasing sympathetic activation that we have, for example, during uh, myocardial, uh, myocardial ischemia. So we know that in physiological condi condition, catecholamine binds the beta adrenergic receptor, which is coupled to the uh, to, um, to trimeric G alpha protein, which activates the adenylate cyclase increase of a cyclic MP and then activation of protein can we say that it's the effect, the second message with the effect on the cardiac contractility. But one of the mechanisms that turn off this mechanism when we come back to the rest condition is related to one of these molecules that is called G protein carboreceptor kinases, the isoform 2. This is a serotonin kinesis that phosphorylates the beta adrenergic receptor in the intracellular loop to the carbocytor neuron the phosphorylation produce the desensitization of this, uh, of this receptor, uncoupling from the, G pro from the protein G, and promotes and increases the affinity of the receptor to the beta resting, inducing the internalization and the down-regulation of the beta energy receptor. During that failure, there is an increased level of release of a catecholamine that starts to store on the plasma member the beta adrenergic receptor during heart failure. And one of the mechanisms that the heart starts to initiate, to protect itself from the store, from the outside the store, is to increase the level of this protein, G protein of GRK2. That increase, however, the level of endocytosis and the degradation of the beta adrenergic receptor, and so increasing the level of down regulation of this kind of uh, protein. Through the year, with, uh, in collaboration with the Professor Koch and uh, the other group that are still working on this kind of protein, one of the first uh, things that we did, starting since already 20 years ago, was to target this protein, G, uh, GRK2, in order to restore the level of beta energy receptor. One of the first uh, strategy that was uh, designed was to use this peptide, I mean this long peptide, because it's the uh, carbocyl terminal portion of GRK2, that's called BARC-CT. Actually it's GRK2 lacking of this kinase activity. So was tested in animal models and was able to displace GRK2 from plasma membrane 
and reduce the effects on the down regulation degradation of the beta allergic receptor. Similar to what, done the, what the beta blockers does during, during the, uh, the heart beat. Okay, but in the, lately, I mean, in the last years, the effects, the rules of this molecule in the mechanism of the heart failure are uh, where uh, there were, we gained more, much more information. One, another important information that was always uh, took from, uh, from, from the lab of, of Professor Koch was that GRK2 uh, was also able to regulate the reuptake of the catecholamine at uh, uh, sympathetic uh, nerve endings. And uh, one of the findings was that there is an increase of uh, liver, the GRK2 is in, involved in the increase of the liver of the uh, catecholamine in the synaptic uh, level. So now, how can we interrogate the level of the sympathetic activity during the heart failure? One of the system, one of the techniques that can be used, that can be employed, is the use of an analog of the catecholamine, which is the uh, meta-iodine benzylguanine. That is an analog, a radio compound, that is an analog of uh, norepinephrine, but that can be reuptaken by the synaptic, presynaptic liver, the presynaptic membrane, but is not degraded. So it can give us the uh, level of the activity of the sympathetic nervous system during the heart attack. This is uh, two parameters that are calculated, and one is the heart to mediastinum ratio, another one is the washing, uh, the washing rate. So actually the ratio between the early image, uh, um, to delayed image, respect to the early image. And getting the, these two parameters, during in a specific trial, in a specific study, the Admire HF, was uh, uh, found that uh, the heart rate, heart rate, uh, heart to mediastinum rate inferior to 1.6 was correlated with increasing level of cardiac adverse effect, actually uh, increasing the mortality in patients with FRM. However, how much this uh, issue, this, uh, this kind of technique can be employed also for other kind of intermediate phenotype? In this other kind of study, the MIPG uh, the, uh, was used also to uh, describe if it was independent from the ejection fraction. And here you can see that uh, there is uh, patients, even with uh, an ejection fraction that was uh, over the 40%, still a 1.6 uh, uh, heart to mediastinum ratio less than 1.6 still correlate with the death or arrhythmic event in patient with, with, uh, with the heart failure. Also, the washing rate in this kind of patients correlates with, a, with, an, increase, with an increasing accumulating event in patients that have a low washing rate respect to the one that have an high uh, washing, uh, I mean the inverse uh, respect to the patient that have a high washing uh, rate. And this is one specific example of how technique can be used, can be employed to define uh, the increasing, the, the increased sympathetic activity that we have during heart failure. Another specific modification that we have during heart failure are metabolic modifications. So this is uh, just an example, one of the hypotheses that has been done during the year for metabolic modification that we have during heart failure, and that correlates increasing adrenergic activity with the, in, with the, uh, the, the, develop, the, the developing of uh, insulin resistance. The hyperadrenergic states increase the level of free fatty acids in the plasma that actually dissociates the use uh, of uh, uncoupled the mitochondria to use correctly the free fatty acids. Contemporarily, the increase the lead, uh, increase the level of uh, ROS production and reduce the ability to uh, glut four to translocate to the plasma membrane. The resulting reduced ITP production uh, promotes the developing the progression of the heart failure. And so in the end, create uh, like a vicious cycle that through the insulin resistance, uh, increased hyperadrenergic uh, state, promotes the progression of the heart failure. So are we able to detect the level of the activity on at least the modification of the, metabolic, of the metabolic pathway during heart failure. 
during the years has been done particular pet studies in this kind of model, in both animal model and both the uh, human model. This is just an example of how the glucose is uptaken in a normal heart. This is a mice model, and you see that uh, the glucose to the FDG is estimated is rapidly and quickly uptaken by the heart. This is what happened in a model of post ischemic heart failure, where the uptake of glucose is delayed is dramatically delayed and reduced respect to the normal animal. The aim of this study was how to correlate, which is the mechanism that correlated the hyperadrenergic state with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the phenomenon of insulin resistance. Always through the PET studies, we used the bar 12 mice, that are mice that overexpress GRK2 only in the heart. And we know that always through PET, that the animal with the transgenic overexpression with GRK2 had lower uptake of glucose. And this also was related to a reduced translocation of MUTO4 to the plasma membrane after insulin stimulation. And the molecular mechanism was related to the ability of GRK2, not only to uh, phosphorylated beta energy receptor, but also the IRS1 uh, substrate, in particular to the serine. Uh, serine sites that has an inhibitor uh, effect on the activity of on the insulin receptor signal. But more important, what we noted is that the modification of the glucose uptake was evident already earlier than the modification of the ejection or the, the cardiac dilatation and the pressure of ejection fraction. Here you can see that, for example, at three weeks post MI, the glucose uptake is already evident. Even if there are no significant, even there are no already, uh, there is no evident cardiac deletion. And then progressively, there is a deletion of the heart. When we employed the AV6 bar CT, the gene delivery to uh, reduce, to uh, counteract the effect of GRK2, the glucose uptake was preserved. And actually, with the, a better shape, with a preserved shape, and uh, counteract the effect of the cardiac removal. Also, the effects on the GLUT4 translocation was preserved in the animal treated with the AV6 uh, bark, uh, bark CT. This study was later also confirmed in the free fatty acid uptake. Lately, always in the lab from, from Professor Koch, has been described as GRK2 can modify and also can induce the degradation of CD36, so reducing the uptake and utilization of the free fat. Collecting all these notions, we recently developed another compound, a pharmacological compound, that was able to inhibit the activity of GRK2 in the heart failure. So this is, for example, microscopy in electro, electro microscopy image of mitochondria in the normal heart. And here what happened during the heart failure. Mitochondria <coughs> are completely rearranged, they are in, uh, increased of volume and decreased with Lo uh, with the loss of the, of the crystal density. This is what happened when we employed the GRK2 our compound, new compound, GRK2 inhibitor, selective GRK2 inhibitor, that is able to restore the mitochondrial shape and uh, function. In particular, also, there is a reduction of the cardiac steatosis that is present in the post mi heart failure. So this means able to recover the ability of the heart, in particular the mitochondria, to use the free fatty acids as a substrate to produce ATP. And in fact, this uh, phenomenon, this phenotype, is recovered measuring the, uh, the metabolic activity, the chain metabolic activity of the mitochondria by using the old-fashioned Clark-type electrode system and measuring the uh, oxygen consumption in present succinate or pyruvate. Here you can see that in the state four, so in the presence, or in the in state three, in the presence of the ATP, there is the reduction of the oxygen compactions, both for succinate and, and pyruvate. That is then restored when we employ the treatment with the GRK2 uh, in. And this result uh, uh, brings to the recovering of the cardiac ATP production in during, uh, during the, 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 the heart. Now, to come back, this is a model of a half ref So with the PET, we are able to introduce, uh, to uh, identify some early modification that we observe during heart failure. During, I mean, 
post ischemic in this case heart attack. The difference, however, the, the point will be to find if it's, we are able to use the same techniques also for other kind of uh, model of uh, heart failure, and in particular for the FT. The problem, I mean, so far we were not able to, I mean, the literature there are not so many different, has not been found so many differences between modification of cardiac metabolic pathway between FPF and FRF, except for some, uh, for the use of the free fatty acids within the, um, in the FRF respect to the, to the uh, FPF. But this is also related to the uh, to problem related, as also mentioned before, to create a good model to study the metabolism in the FPF, in the trans in translational model of FPF. However, this is a recent study made in SHR animal, demonstrate how in SHR the glucose uptake is increased really at three months respect to the Wistar Kyoto animal before the dilation or depression or advancement of the heart failure is uh, even present in this kind, in this model, on this model of uh, animal. Third point of this, uh, of this talk. So we have now, uh, we have discussed, so far we have discussed about the, the, the modification of the sympathetic activity, in general, as example of neurohormonal activation, metabolic pathway. But also during heart failure, we can have like subtle modification of the cardiac structure, in particular of the systolic function of the heart. So one of the, uh, the techniques that can be employed is always through echocardiography by using the concept of the cardiac strain. I mean, the term of strain used to describe the shortening, the thickening, and the lengthening, lengthening of a myocardium in a specific segment or region of the heart. And this is generally measured to the mean. There are people here that probably are more, no more than me, but it can be, uh, can be done through the tissue Doppler velocity or through the speckle tracking. The speckle tracking has the advantage to not be modified, I mean, to be not affected by the angle variability. And actually, it's based on the concept to the sounded myocardium, so that gives you like some, a sort of map of pixel in grayscale of a specific segment of the heart that is then searched in the following cycle. Of, uh, in the following cardiac sample. And it can be done in three uh, main uh, axes of this specific seg segment, on the longitudinal or in circumfer circumferential, all radial axis of this specific segment of the heart. This is the, the example of the cardiac longitudinal strain that is made in four apical uh, chamber uh, view. And is, uh, as you can understand, is a give, gives you a negative uh, number. Here, the, the dot, the white dot line, describes the average, the cardiac, the, the average of the cardiac longitude, longitude, longitude and strain. And here is the sample of the radial strain that is calculated in the short, in the short axis. Which are the application of the cardiac strain in the, uh, in, in the model, in the model of heart failure? This is one of typical example that can be employed, for example, during scan, during ischemia. This is the normal longitudinal strain, as you can see, the negative curve during the systole, this, this history, and here after quick after uh, soon after the occlusion of the uh, of the coronary artery, where there is the depression of the uh, systolic function of the longitudinal strain during the systole, but with a post-systolic longitudinal strain, that means that there is a still vital myocardial in that cell. Here, there are the advanced uh, lesions, where there is this dyskinesia, there is this uh, um, opposite effect, I mean, this, uh, uh, this effect on the, the segment, and here there is completely uh, atonic, uh, passive segment of the heart. That means, I mean, that it is not possible to recover the contractility of this, this segment of, of the heart. But we can employ the strain for other kind of application, for other kind of mode. This is the example in uh, hypertrophy uh, cardiomyopathy. This is an example of a male of 20 years old with an hypertrophic cardiomyopathy related, uh, gene-related, gene 
with an injection, with a still a preserved ejection fraction, asymptomatic, and no uh, patterns of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy at the ACG, at the echo, or at the ma magnetic resonance. But already, with the modification of the strain, on the longitudinal, longitudinal strains, already evident. So, the strain can be employed also to detect this, this subtle modification already in uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Another kind of discussion we, should, we can do it for the dilated cardiomyopathy. We know everybody that, I mean, the, one of the first issues, one of the big problems that we have generally in clinic is to distinguish from the dilated cardiomyopathy that can be secondary after, like for example, after myocardial ischemia, ischem, and those ones that are considered not, non ischemic. In general, left ventricular or B-ventricular systolic DCM are defined, are defined as left ventricular or biventricular systolic dysfunction and deletion that are not explained by abnormal loading condition. We recognize two main etiological groups, genetic and non-genetic, and there are a broad vari variety of mutations underlying the genetic DCM, generally sarcomeric, laminin, and titin mutation being the most frequent. As I said, the biggest uh, problem is generally also to distinguish between the different etiology. And also in this case, we can employ the different techniques to try to distinguish which is the cause of the DCM. This is an, an example using employing the uh, cardiac ma magnetic uh, resonance that in this case allow to distinguish the DCM from non-compacted heart respect to the real DCM or even to an hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that is evolved, that uh, has evolved as a, um, dilated, as a dilated cardiomyopathy. But still, another kind of approach is also to detect the early systolic dysfunction that can be detected in DCM by the global longitudinal strain. This is just an example of how this patient has been categorized uh, in patient with general uh, genotypic negative and phenotype negative, so use it as control, uh, positive, ge uh, genotypic uh, positive, but still with a negative phenotype, and patient that have already the appearance of the disease. Even if the ejection fraction is not modified, the global logical strain is already modified, and give you the, uh, the notion that uh, already at the beginning, at the ignition, at the, uh, in the early phase of the disease, we can note it, it can be evidenced that some uh, specific, in specific regions, specific segment of the heart, the systolic uh, dysfunction. And here, this is the summary of all uh, the patients that has been evaluated, evaluated during this uh, group with uh, a significant uh, reduction of uh, the global longitudinal strain in, the, uh, in, um, in positive. Uh, in uh, genotypic, genotypic positive, but the phenotype negative uh, patients. So the concept is that we can employ uh, different kind of uh, techniques, for example, to, identify, to, to early identify patient, patient with DCM and start earlier the uh, therapeutic uh, strategy. So if, for example, as I said, to uh, using employing the, the, the cardiac longitudinal strain. Another approach, as a, I mean, another example of how cardiac strain can be employed in uh, preserved, it, it, it's in the matter of uh, uh, heart failure with preserved uh, ejection fraction. Even in this case, in patients with uh, FPEF, we can note some modification of the cardiac longitudinal strain respect to even control, and also in patients with uh, with uh, with uh, with upper. Another important matter is related to the detection of cardiotoxicity. We generally know that uh, in the issue, in the, in the, we often uh, argue with the oncology, which is the best way to predict, to consider uh, when we have to stop or to continue a specific anti-cancer uh, anti therapy. And often we argue with them that, uh, I mean, we should not consider it just the ejection fraction as a specific parameter to decide if a patient has to go on with the, uh, the anti-cancer therapy. This table summarizes some of the, uh, of the parameters that can be employed to detect the modification of the heart during anti-cancer therapy. 
and besides beyond the uh, calculation of the ejection fraction, so an uh, a reduction of 10% point degrees to a value of the lobe okay, that suggests a cardiotoxicity, also the global longitudinal strain uh, uh, um, can be employed uh, to suggest the risk of, uh, of a cardiotoxicity. This is uh, like a nice, a nice example of patients that with the, with the normal ejection fraction pre-therapy, with the reduction of uh, uh, significant reduction of the longitudinal strain with still uh, normal preserved ejection fraction that uh, is less than the cutoff that is still employed, and then, I mean, in the final, the uh, further reduction after 12 months with the uh, further reduction of the ejection fraction. And this is one of the algorithms that has been recently uh, proposed to uh, define, I mean, to follow patients with the uh, for detection, for the early detection of the, of the cardiotoxicity. Uh, so, in conclusion, early identification of the biochemical, metabolic, and systolic dysfunction is possible to the combination of different imaging techniques. The identification of these subtle alterations have, can have relevance in diagnosis therapy and also for the risk assessment of the patients and maybe probably the implementation and the root and the use of, for example, of the cardiac strain may lead to a redefinition of the concept of a systolic cardiac function in our field. So meaning that the use of the ejection fraction, as we generally do in patients to the Simpson or to the Texas, is probably all, only the last phase when we uh, detect, we try to uh, address our risk assessment or our prognosis or to decide our therapy. And there can be employed other kind of technique to uh, better uh, address it, to improve the prognosis of our patients. So finally, let me acknowledge, let me uh, thank all the, my collaborators in my uh, outpatient clinic, my ambulatory for outpatient clinic, and the people from the lab, and of course, my uh, young collaborator, collaborator at home that keep me busy also when, when I am at home. Thanks for your attention.